Welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Seta DC webinar on a new book called Exit from Hegemony, the Unraveling of American Global uh, Order and written by Alex Cooley and Daniel Nexon. Uh, we are lucky to have both of uh, the authors here today. Uh, their bios are available on our website. Uh, Alex is from, uh, Alex, Professor Cooley is from Columbia University and Professor Nexon is from Georgetown University. And uh, this is a book uh, event. So what we will do is we will start with a short presentation of the book, what the authors were uh, trying to say, what are their main arguments. Following that, I will have some questions. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, you can write to the uh, chat window uh, on Zoom. And if you are not on Zoom on Twitter, you can write your questions as a response to our tweets uh, under the, as a comment and our friends will, and my assistants will pick them up and send it to me and we will try to answer as much question as possible. And uh, let's start, uh, Professor Cooley, do you want to start the presentation? Sure, I think actually my colleague Dan will start yeah. and he will, yeah. uh, uh, we have some slides that we're gonna share with everyone here. Are you seeing, uh, are you seeing this okay? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. So um, thanks for having us here. Uh, we'll just uh, get moving and uh, hopefully we can get to the question discussion as soon as possible. So what are, so we started writing this book over 10 years ago. And while um, it, we think it turns out to be fairly current, uh, I want to be clear that the underlying mechanisms and processes that we identify are ones that we were talking about 2006, 2007. Uh, so I think that, that you could see a lot of what's coming uh, well over a decade ago. So our basic arguments, I wanna start with our kind of, kind of main takeaways. Uh, the first is that uh, the US is no longer the global hegemonic power it was in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Now we should be clear, it's still the most powerful country in the world and it may remain so for a long time, but it's not the kind of global dominant actor uh, that it was. Secondly, that's not coming back. Um, there is no a way barring some exogenous shock or major change that the United States will be able to engage in the kind of ordering uh, and global projects that it engaged in uh, in the 90s. The question now is the scope of US influence, including the fate of its core system, roughly the alliance networks built during the Cold War. Third, Trump is not the root cause of these developments, and replacing him will not, barring some kind of exogenous shock, bring back the 1990s and early 2000s. Rather, it's better to think about Trump and Trump foreign policy as both a symptom and an accelerant of a series of underlying trends. Now, we're going to start with some background because the mechanisms that produced U.S. global hegemony also explain why it's unraveling. So in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, the consensus was that the United States strode the world like a colossus. Madeleine Albright famously called the US the indispensable nation. This was very different, however, from what some predicted with the end of the Cold War, which was that the world was rapidly entering a period of multipolarity of multiple competing great powers, including the United States, Germany, Japan, and Russia. Indeed, it was also a marked difference from anxieties about US decline that dominated the middle of the 1980s. Many scholars believe that we were entering a post-hegemonic world then. The Bretton Woods system had collapsed, Germany and Japan were on the rise, and the USSR had successfully asserted itself as a pure competitor. Paul Kennedy published the famous book, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers, and lent historical weight to the idea that the US was overextended, fiscally unbalanced, neglecting domestic priorities, and needed to successfully adjust while getting its allies to pick up more of the defense burden. Straight line projections showed Japan would overtake the United States as the world's largest economy in the 1990s. Pundits and scholars argued that the US needed to learn from superior Japanese business and economic policy. Japanese authors, for their part, wrote about the US bullying on matters of burden sharing and trade policy. Now, as I said, we can learn a great deal about what's happening now and why this time is different by looking back at why these scholars were wrong. So the first problem for this projection was that Japan entered its last decade, while the US experienced unexpectedly strong growth in the 1990s. This is a nice chart showing straight line projections versus how things actually wound up. 
Secondly, nationalist uprisings brought down the Soviet outer empire and then spread to the, United, the, U, the USSR itself and brought down the Soviet Union, leaving the United States alone at the top by default when it came to military power, at least. The United States also had the world's largest economy by most metrics and, and this is important, almost all of the other major economic powers were part of the US alliance system. The G7 alone controlled roughly 40% of world GDP in purchasing power parity terms, which is the least favorable measure for the United States since the strength of the US dollar, some say, inflates US GDP in nominal terms. Now, a fair number of scholars focus on unipolarity, the position of the US as the sole superpower, largely in these terms that I've just described, in military terms, in raw economic size. We think it's important to go under the hood to get a sense of the mechanisms at work in the quote unquote unipolar moment. And because not everyone in the audience is likely to have a background in international relations, we'll illustrate this by turning to another manifestation of liberal capitalist globalization of the 1990s. What I mean by that, and I apologize for the phone ringing, there's really nothing I can do about that, <laughs> is I mean the increasing dominance of Walmart in small town America. Walmart often drove out the small businesses found in Main Street, leaving it the only game in town for the purchases of food and weapons. Well, they didn't actually sell handguns to my knowledge, they did sell sporting rifles. Now, it wasn't that there weren't alternatives. You could mail order this stuff. There were some businesses left. There were other supermarkets, for example. But these were generally kind of marginal. Uh, so basically, goods and service, um, they, these were basically marginal. They were not really competitive. Uh, now, imagine if it wasn't just that Walmart supplied these things, but Walmart was also the only option for banking as well. Uh, so basically, goods and services of any type are gonna be subject to Walmart's terms and choices and their activities are gonna set the entire market. Now let's go further. Let's imagine that Walmart is also the only model of business that people see as viable and worthwhile. So the vast majority of people want to be or to replicate Walmart. And now imagine if Walmart greeters, you know, the people who met you in the store and said, welcome to Walmart, weren't just in the store, but were wandering around town and coming to your homes and pitching Walmart and showing you how to be a great Walmart customer and get the most from Walmart. And indeed, that some of them were volunteers, right? While others worked not for Walmart directly, but for pro-Walmart foundations and NGOs, spreading the gospel and the way of life of Walmart. Well, this semi-fictional Walmart is, of course, the United States in the 1990s. There were basically three major mechanisms that are associated with what we've just said, or three processes. The first is that the United States, and actually more significantly, the United States and its allies, the West, so-called, so enjoyed a near patronage monopoly. There were other sources of military guarantees, security guarantees of aid, there, but really nothing with the same scope or, um, or depth as that offered by the United States and its European powers in Japan. Uh, or through its uh, lending institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. There was also an implosion of alternative great power orders. It's important to remember the collapse of the Soviet Union didn't just get rid of a military competitor, it discredited an entire alternative order that had been an alternative system that had been an ideological rival to the kind of liberal capitalism offered by the United States, and also took with it an entire, down with it, an entire infrastructure of institutions and trade arrangements that had made up the Soviet system. Uh, and finally, and this is something when I talk about greeters I want to stress that I think doesn't get enough attention, is that uh, what developed in the 1990s was a liberal or transnational civil society composed heavily of NGOs and activists anchored in the United States and elsewhere that were pushing liberal values, were pushing uh, notions of capitalism and rights and things like that, and who were flooding, say, the post-communist zone, teaching uh, people how to do a free press, uh, helping people build how to understand how to do civil disobedience, trying to build a democratic civil society. These were sort of the foot soldiers of uh, the US hegemonic project. Now all of this is reversing. Uh, there are new goods providers in town, such as China. Uh, uh, and this is, and the fundamental reason for this is that as you all know, as everyone is aware, the United States is in the midst of a power transition marked by the relative decline of the American economy and the relative rise of China. Using PPP measures of GDP, the transition has always already happened. Uh, 
Using nominal measures, the gap is closing. So either way you look at it, we have obviously both in metrics and in real world, uh, the rise of China. But it's not just the rise of China. This is part of a broader story about a great power, about a power shift away from the so-called West uh, towards the so-called rest in general, but Asia in particular. Uh, it's not that the U.S. economy has been declining so much in relative terms, but those of its long-term partners in the G7. Uh, this matters a great deal for reasons that we'll discuss shortly. Now, that means that there are a whole bunch of countries outside of the U.S. core system that are now capable of providing international goods. And Alex will pick up here. All right. Thanks, Dan. And Dan, it would be possible to share full screens so we get a better sense of just on, on the presentation if we just uh, enlarge that. And, and are you not seeing the full screen? That's what I was asking. Yeah, no, no we're seeing? just seeing, just seeing a, a, a part of it in there, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll pick things up and then we can. Uh, are you seeing like a, are you seeing like a bunch of things on the bottom? There's a little thing. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're seeing oh, some seeing of the, the thumbnails on the bottom. And okay, the, yeah. I will finish, I will fix that right now. Perfect. Okay. So just My pick apologies. up and thanks again. Not at all. Thanks, thanks again for, uh, uh, hmm. for inviting us. So to emphasize the three pathways, and to Kilch's point, how is this different than in the past? The three pathways that were once associated with preserving and sustaining American dominance have now all become contested. And so this isn't just a is cyclical better? trend. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, this isn't just a cyclical trend. Uh, this is a permanent unraveling. Um, and so um, the first path, alternative good providers, right? The U.S. is no longer Walmart dominant, that you have other aid and goods providers of things like development assistance. Um, and recently, as we see emergency public health assistance, as we've seen China in a very vocal way offer emergency goods to Serbia, to Italy, um, you know, never mind that some of these were fulfillment of procurement contracts and, 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 and so forth, but they were presented as emergency aid and the politics of it was that China was providing global goods in this emergency type of role. Uh, next one. Second, um, regimes, even in smaller powers that we normally consider to be weaker, have become much more adept at leveraging providers of alternative goods and alternative patrons um, and playing them off the U.S. So the gentleman that you see uh, on your screen to your left, that was Kurmanbek Bakiev. He was president of the Kyrgyz Republic. And Bakiev, in, during the midst of the last financial crisis in February uh, 2009, initiated the base bidding war. Um, it, Kyrgyzstan hosted the most important U.S. military base for the campaign in Afghanistan at Manas. Uh, and under pressure from Russia, uh, Russia offered a large $2 billion emergency assistance package to Kyrgyzstan. Um, and on the same day, the Kyrgyz president announced the closing of the military base. Now, in this particular case, um, the U.S. behind the scenes increased its offer of rent for Manas. Uh, and so Kyrgyzstan accepted the first payment from Russia and then turned around and extended the lease. Um, nevertheless, this small Central Asian country initiating this bidding, bizarre uh, type of dynamic between these two uh, great powers um, it, you know, is a symbol of, of, of playing multiple patrons off one another. Um, on your right, um, you'll see, and I think Dan, uh, 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 this is uh, Duterte because I, I can't see. Uh, it's it's Duterte. Name. Yeah, it's Duterte. Yep. Um, uh, another good example, oh. again, of someone who was a traditional U.S. ally, uh, there we go, uh, leveraging um, alternative patrons. So Duterte uh, announces that he's canceling the visiting forces agreement with the U.S. and that he wants to partner now more with Russia and with China in uh, economic and security relations. And the last one. Um. And the last one is 
we used to have the space that was dominated by liberal NGOs, the Walmart, Walmart greeters who were essentially the Western and- No, US no, no, you're on alternative NGOs. ordering. I'm alternative ordering, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we just, uh, we just did that. Um, no. Okay, good, alternative. Oh, right, yes, alternative ordering. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Sorry, apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, so the second one is that Russia and China now have their own ordering projects. They're not just playing by the rules. They're not just integrating into the West. They are providers of order. And this happens in three different ways. One, they are establishing new institutions like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, new institutions in Russia and the post-Soviet space. And this is a chart from the book where that you see that the majority of these new institutions are being joined in by countries in Central Asia and in Southeast Asia. Um, then you have bilateral initiatives like the Belt and Road, where China is uh, engaging in its own uh, types of relationships, providing infrastructure funds, but also standard setting uh, and reaching uh, side deals with different countries. And final slide. And all that means that even in existing institutions now, China and Russia have more leverage than they used to. This is a map of the vote uh, in the UN Human Rights Council, um, the initial vote criticizing China for its re-education camps in Xinjiang. And you'll see in green are the countries that sent the first critical letter about China's human rights practices. So the 21 countries, U.S. is not part of that because the U.S. withdrew. Um, and you see they're the traditional countries of the U.S. liberal core. Then China mobilizes a group of countries uh, to uh, not only reject this assessment, but, but talk about China as uh, a preserver of human rights treaties. And so here you see countries like Russia, countries in Latin America, Africa, uh, the Middle East, all supportive of the Chinese position on human rights rather than the Western position. A lot of these countries, of course, are in Belt and Road partners, uh, and a lot of them are implicated in these new regional organizations. So these new regional organizations are also recasting and promoting Chinese power within existing human rights bodies. Then the final mechanism that I got ahead of myself um, is that we are no longer in a world where transnational movements just means liberal Western NGOs. Uh, and in fact, we have uh, a number of now transnational networks um, that uh, operate both within the West and out of the West and promote illiberal, for lack of a better word, uh, types of policy positions and issue networks. Um, and so these counter ordering movements that go up against liberal uh, movements um, has been much more the standard, uh, uh, the standard state of affairs in global politics. When you think back to the sort of the 20s and the 30s, uh, when you think uh, back further, their uh, counter order and transnationalism becomes contested. And just to give some examples, um, Russian support for um, far right or anti-systemic groups uh, in Europe, um, such as Marine Le Pen. Um, one could even talk about the Brexit movement, um, wanting to dismantle um, um, the UK's place within the European architecture and its links that it had to certain aspects of um, um, right-wing uh, uh, advisors, many of them um, to the Trump campaign there, and we see that on the right. Next one. you see mirror movements to sort of so-called Western human rights movements. So what you see there on the left is a slide of the meeting of the World Congress of the Families, which is a transnational movement that promotes conservative causes. Um, and it includes uh, Christian right movements um, within the US and links them up to counterparts all around the world and have annual meetings that focus on um, family um, and organized religion. Uh, and themes like this. And then on the right, you see uh, a slide documenting the visit of a National Rifle Association to Russia uh, on an exchange delegation. So our point here is that it used to be that NGOs and transnationalism and the way that we studied it even in international relations was assumed to be promoting liberal values. Um, while um, of course, there are still a lot of NGOs that operate this way. We've seen governments both try and block 
such efforts by liberal NGOs and now actively support counter movements um, that oppose them in terms of their policy preferences. Next one. So uh, I'll finish this out. Um, these things might feel a little bit disconnected in terms of, well, you've got counter order movements, you've got uh, alternative order building, you've got um, exit options, uh, increasing the leverage of states that used to kind of have to go along with the United States, whether they wanted to or not. Um, but in fact, uh, these are all interconnected and you can begin to understand how they're interconnected if you look at how positive feedback works during periods of power transitions like the ones we have today. So when you have a power transition, this creates on the one hand new, uh, it creates new opportunities for new kinds of ideologies, right? So you think about, for example, China's success starts offering up uh, capitalist authoritarianism as a particular model or as Russia becomes more, uh, recovers from the 90s and begins to sort of pitch itself and, and pitch, its, pitch an ideology, an export ideology, it focuses on cultural conservatism, uh, largely initially as a way I think of demobilizing Western NGOs, but in a way that starts making it attractive to other kinds of counter order movements. Um, and so you start to have a kind of greater imagination and also greater demand. If things aren't going so well in the incumbent powers, uh, then obviously people there will become dissatisfied with the way that politics are arranged and they'll start pushing back in ways that have implications for international order. Uh, so this sort of can strengthen counter order movements and those counter order movements, to give you one example, uh, can fragment or weaken or disrupt uh, the, the, the functioning of uh, incumbent powers of uh, people who are trying to sort of uphold in the way they see it the current order and in doing so uh, they can speed the power transition or they can take control of states. So uh, to give you, uh, you know, the most obvious example of this is in the 1930s when the fascist movement began as a counter order movement but ultimately seized control of important powers uh, and brought about a confrontation that, you know, devastated the world. Uh, we can also think of, for example, about the way that um, uh, that liberal movements in the, 18, in the 19th century uh, helped to disrupt the concert system by agitating against absolutism and, and non-constitutional monarchy. Uh, and then when, they, and when these take control of the states, even if we're not talking about situations of sort of World War II style conflict, uh, those states are much more likely to exit the current arrangement, they're more likely to throw their support on challengers, and they're likely to provide sources of emulation. Uh, similarly, there are, there, uh, similarly, they're also more likely to be able to do so precisely because that patriotic monopoly has been undermined so that they can look to other states as potential sources of support. Um, so think about the way, for example, that Viktor Orban um, talks about uh, multipolarity as being a good opportunity and working with the Russians and the Chinese and being less dependent on the United States. Those are the kind of opportunities that are opened up during power transitions uh, for movements and regimes that are uncomfortable, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, with certain aspects of prevailing international norms and rules. Now, the really unusual thing about the current uh, uh, current circumstance, I think, uh, can be summed up by the fact that um, the United States, that, that Trump himself is in fact um, leading uh, a, one of these kinds of uh, reactionary or, or right-wing populist counter-order movements. Again, that's not a normative judgment. You can think that his goals are correct, but nonetheless, he himself is part of a movement that sees the prevailing global order as um, uh, producing inequality, empowering uh, global elites, and it's one that needs to be upturned and changed. And you've seen, of course, this play out as Trump has uh, withdrawn from numerous treaties and arrangements, most recently uh, threatened to cut ties with, probably is cutting ties with, it's hard to tell when he makes threats, um, the World Health Organization, uh, leaving that space then <laughs> as greater spaces of leverage for states that have been engaged in alternative order building and order contestation within incumbent institutions. So the United States itself is actually now um, run by an executive branch that is interested in forwarding and supporting uh, 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 counter, not just its, in its own policies uh, 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 against order, but also interested in kind of rhetorically uh, putting its thumb on the scale in favor of similar movements in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, and this is not a very typical arrangement. Usually counter order movements do not capture uh, the the hegemonic power. Usually the hegemonic power is um, trying to suppress them or fight against them or fight against or, or contest states that have uh, been taken over uh, 
by these kinds of movements. So in that sense, we're sort of in uncharted waters. Uh, and, if, and so we think that these positive feedback loops uh, are intensifying uh, and are likely to see a, a increasing cascading concatenation of exits from order, of alternative order building and of new movements and, and strengthened movements arising that are trying to push governments uh, to alter their stance on, uh, on order. And in that sense, not just, this isn't just kind of a story ultimately about kind of liberalism, but that order is of course the very infrastructure by which the United States has exercised hegemony, even if it's sometimes engaged in illiberal uh, modes or in fact taken steps that have undermined aspects of that order. Uh, and that's, I think, a good place to stop and have a discussion. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, we have a set of questions and I will start with some audience questions actually. Uh, Ishan Tahur from uh, Washington Post asks, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering if the panelists had any thoughts on how the past few months of the pandemic and now the past week of protest has impacted the rest of the world's perception of US power on the world stage. Yeah, it's- Who wants to go? It's, yeah, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Dan can fill okay. in if, if he disagrees or if I miss sure. something. Uh, I think certainly um, what you've seen with COVID is, again, as with Trump, the acceleration on steroids of some of these dynamics. And so mm -hmm. I, I want to separate the arguments that we're making in our book aren't really arguments about U.S. soft power, right? It's mm -hmm. not about popularity of the president. It's not about, you know, necessarily sort of image, although, you know, there are sort of status considerations. Um, but what you've seen with COVID is an absence of U.S. leadership in many of these fora. And in fact, with the WHO, this attempt to scapegoat China um, and the announcement to sort of withdraw from the WHO, right, um, is built on this logic that the U.S. can then get its way with the WHO, right? That's the bet. In, instead, what we're seeing is that China is stepping up and promising to fill in the funding gap hole, thereby rendering it more powerful within the WHO, not less powerful. Mm -hmm. Right. So so this this negotiating tactic of kind of stripping bare all these international institutions. So it's just about power, just about bilateral power in this particular case, I think, and we would argue is going to backfire because this infrastructure of ordering that the U.S. built by unraveling and withdrawing it, it's doing damage to itself. The second mechanism I would point to is this attempt by China portray itself as an emergency goods provider. That's what hegemons do in crisis. Usually we think of goods though, in terms of public goods in crisis or Kindleberger's famous argument, but about the great depression, lacking a global leader. China's, and it has domestic allies in places, try to portray itself here as that leader. Now, China has also uh, made a lot of political mistakes. Right, and so you've had a lot of negative coverage of what it was doing. Of course, its role in covering up COVID, um, the fact that a lot of this medical equipment that it was touting was actually pretty shoddy and subpar, and these countries have paid for it. You know, so so it's not as if you know China sort of come out looking uh, at this great. It's just that the dynamics that we've been pointing to have accelerated. Uh, and then when we talk about partisan polarization, I'll, I'll let Dan sort of step in more on that. Um, but certainly one needs as a hegemon to have a relatively stable set of guiding principles, uh, sets of what the national interest is like. And now what we're seeing is almost the full on politicization now of U.S. foreign policy and security policy uh, in a way that is um, just surging these unraveling dynamics. And there are some interesting things here, and I don't. I know there are a lot of other questions, so I'll just I'll just kind of raise two of them. The first is that on well, these have to do with political polarization. So the first thing is that uh, what's interesting is that China, Russia, to a lesser extent, lots of regional players, right, um, are engaged in a lot of alternative order building now, right? Um, there are regional organizations, multilateral fora, bilateral ties. So you see an explosion of kind of rooting around or developing these. Uh, alternatives to the United States uh, into the or to Western-led order, um, and those. Uh, and what's interesting is that the United States, 
is not, so it's not just that the United States is right now kind of trying to actively dismantle some of the, the original order, it's that the United States may not be capable of engaging in those kinds of ordering maneuvers anymore, right? And that's because of polarization. So it's very hard to imagine a new major treaty ever being passed in the United States, right? A new major organization being founded by the United States and uh, ratified in a way that, that locks it down as an entity. Right. In the same way that look at the, we look at the fate of the TPP or other attempts to negotiate big, large trade deals that might uh, reconfigure that order uh, in ways that have to do with contemporary realities like the rise of Asia or European, the market power of the European Union. So the polarization of international politics makes those kind, not only makes it hard to, to credibly maintain commitments because of whiplash between presidents as different presidents are elected, but it also makes it hard to make new ones just because of the structure of veto points in the US system. Uh, the second point I wanted to make, and this is something that we really emphasize in the book, is that it really is, I think, significant that Trumpism, again, agree or disagree, is part of a broader transnational counterorder movement uh, that shares some ideology and some coordination. Uh, and so what you have now is that the, it's, it's not just that the, so what you have is that the, what we think of as US political polarization is now aligned with international polarization, right, and international contention in a way that I think we often think of the United States as sort of isolated from, or the hegemon kind of being outside of the political dynamics that operate within a hegemonic order. And that's clearly not the case anymore. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And I don't think that's gonna be the case going forward, right? Thank you very much. And uh, this is my question actually, when I was reading your book, uh, one thing that comes to my mind is uh, for the last 50 years, probably we have a lot of those moments of the decline of the US. Uh, of even after Sputnik, Sputnik right, uh, after Vietnam in 1980s, even uh, you mentioned uh, Paul Kennedy's book uh, at the rise of Japan, even in 1990s, we had these arguments about the rise of Germany, rise of European Union, rise of China. So uh, what if this moment is one of those moments? And what if we are facing, what we are witnessing is emergence of another form of hegemony? instead of an exit from hegemony, right? After the Bretton Woods system, after the oil crisis, we have these debates in, in, among the international relations scholars that this is the end of US hegemony, but it turns out that it is not. So uh, what do you think this is a total exit? Because in your book, you said you uh, write this, we conclude that the international system is too far down multiple pathways to allow for a return of America's former hegemonic role. Exit is, is upon us. So what makes you so certain that this is the moment that it is really an exit? It's a great question and a fair question. I'll take a, I'll take a stab at it. I think the main argument or the main thing we want to stress is that we have a very stylized vision of how we mark change in the international system and international orders. And they're usually centered um, and being or associated with systemic wars, right? So we take large wars as the point, aha, you see, that was the point in which the new order came in. And then we do the same with the Cold War. Um, there, there was a peaceful collapse in terms of peaceful, in terms of the two superpowers not contesting a hegemonic war. Um, but we, we tend to do the same. We look for these markers. What we say, if you look under the lid and you look at these mechanisms, that the transformation of the international system is already there, right? When you look at the uh, amount of regional organizations, for instance, and regional diplomacy that countries in South Asia, Central Asia, Eurasia are engaging in, it's primarily with Chinese and Russian led institutions. Um, so uh, 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 we can go down just the list of things like economic liberalism, intergovernmentalism, um, and democracy. And then each of these pillars see a substantial evolution from where we're in the 1990s. So I think I, I'm going to answer this in, in a kind of a cryptic way by saying it's not any one thing. It's that these pillars that we have become accustomed to seeing in certain ways as associated with US hegemony are not necessarily sustaining US hegemony anymore. And hence, I think the example of the pro-China vote 
in the UN Human Rights Council, this body that was supposedly founded with a commitment to universal human rights practices and values that was um, for the most part uh, dictated by and, and, and controlled by sort of Western institutions now is playing a very different role and purpose. So things may look the same in form, um, but in terms of their substance, uh, they've actually changed quite a bit. And yes, we would argue um, we are well down the pathway of exit. Dan? Dan? Well, there are a lot of questions. So I'll just add that one of the reasons why we begin with the story about the 1980s and the 1990s is to emphasize that the 1990s were really unusual precisely because you had this collapse of a great power, right? And that was really made possible by two factors uh, that were related. The, the entire collapse of a rival order kind of overnight uh, in the way that left the United States not only as having outsized military spending and all that stuff, but it left the U.S. Uh, alliance infrastructure uh, as being uh, the a, a kind of cartel of all, you know that concentrated almost all the world's economic wealth, right? Or you know, a, a plural, you know, forty-two percent, forty-four percent of the world's economic wealth in non-nominal terms. Uh, and there's just there was no way that was going to last. <laughs> Uh, period, right? Uh, uh, uneven growth, power diffuses, uh, institutions change, but you would need something of that kind of, you would need something of that kind of uh, magnitude, right? A complete collapse of a whole series of other powers for the United States to have that kind of opportunity. I am actually doing a book cast. Lyra, I'm doing a live book cast. Is mom around? I'll take care of, I'm going to have to go. Yeah, it's, um, okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. <laughs> this is the, our life now, isn't it? <laughs> um, but, um, but the, um, but anyway, so that's, uh, so yeah, well, let's, I'll just, I'll just stop. So yeah, it's possible you can have these shocks, but we think that we're seeing now where pe a lot of people are saying, aha, this means, you know, where they're saying, look, China's doing this or look at all these institutions or look at whatever, and there's, they're sort of seeing this as being the inflection point. We think the inflection point already happened. And these are the mm -hmm. signs, these are the, what we're seeing is the realization of that inflection point. But I don't wanna stress, this doesn't mean the United States isn't gonna be the most powerful state in the world, right? It doesn't mean that it can maintain a coalition of most of the largest economies in the world. Um, we tend to also assume that when US hegemony goes, it's gonna be the, uh, itself an implosion, like the collapse of the British empire or something like that. And that's not generally, how the world is gonna look. We're gonna see a lot of the same kind of order, a lot of the same kinds of institutions, a lot of multilateralism. Uh, we're gonna see the United States still being able to, 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 to play the great power game, probably play it better than a lot of other states unless it completely destroys that capacity. Um, and we're also gonna see it being able to wield, you know, continue to overhang like dollar hegemony in ways that are gonna give it a lot of influence. Uh, we need to set our expectations correct, right? And not think that it's a kind of either the United States is a stride of the world like the Colossus, or it's like some second tier power, right? There are a lot of, there's a lot in between, and we're in that in between now, we think. Uh, so another audience question, Dan Lieberman asks, uh, if the US continues to lose leadership, will it resort to a too aggressive uh, policy, which can stumble into war in order to reassert a leadership position? What is the best approach for the U.S. to at least maintain a powerful position? Do you want me to take that, Alex? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So um, this is where um, our own political views may be mixing with our uh, academic analytic stuff. So always take what we have to say with a grain of salt. But nonetheless, this is what we believe. That's exactly right. One of the things that's most concerning to us about the approach that the Trump administration has taken has been a kind of slash and burn of certain kinds of capital and resources that usually you assume that states maintain through institutional, uh, through institutional um, overhang long after they even lose their great power status. So think about the fact that Britain continued to have a, a really excellent diplomatic corps that was well regarded long after the empire went away, right? So the Trump administration has been kind of slashing and burning uh, our diplomatic capital. Right, our institutional capacity to engage in diplomacy. It's been pulling out of these institutions uh, that we're in or reducing our presence in them, uh, leaving them open to other 
powers uh, without being able to build alternatives, right? So it's, and I think it's doing so in part because there's this kind of belief that these things are soft power and therefore they're not real and only power is hard power and the world with hard power is best, where hard power rules the, the roost is best because the United States is so powerful. Um, the problem is exactly right that, that we lose, as, we denude, denude, as we destroy those capabilities, we become more and more reliant on kinetic power, right, on coercive power, which means when the United States does want to assert itself, it can't do through, through institutional channels and all these ties and networks that it developed over decades. Uh, it has to do so through the threat of force or the threat of sanctions and in ways that actually other states can adapt to. Right. So, um, so yeah, I think that right now it's really dangerous because we're heading towards an environment and we've been doing this for years, but it's getting worse in which the United States is really reliant on the use of force to exert hegemonic influence uh, it, because it is letting those other capacities erode. The second thing is the United States can maintain a lot of its capacity if it does basic things like engage in significant domestic investments, <laughs> like develop human capital, like develop infrastructure. Um, if it does what it did after uh, in the 1950s and look at something like the Sputnik moment and actually make these huge investments. The United States has been coasting on those big investments in science and technology, by the way, that it made in the 50s and 60s. Uh, until now, even as US government R&D for non-biotech has overall been re in relative decline. Um, and what we've done actually is we've, we've looked, we've taken the fruits of those huge investments, things like the internet, uh, things like um, other types of, of technological capabilities, and we've somehow convinced ourselves that this was the work of a bunch of kind of like uh, uh, entrepreneurial nerds in Silicon Valley, that they weren't building on this tremendous infrastructure. And so if we want to stay in the game for as long as we can, we need to cultivate both the bases of American power uh, and we need to cultivate these forms of power that have really been the infrastructure of U.S. power uh, that have to do with cooperative arrangements and diplomacy uh, and, uh, and uh, long-standing ties uh, and even, even to the point of interorganizational and interpersonal relationships in the military and in, in the diplomatic corps. Um, and those things are really super important. And that's the kind of thing that we should focus on conserving if you want to maintain U.S. power. Um, uh. Alex, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, no, I think uh, I'll take another one. Another, another question is uh, coming from Elaine and it is on the uh, actually Biden presidency. Uh, and I will uh, reformulate that question with my question uh, of all. So uh, in your book, you, uh, you mentioned that Trump is not, uh, Trump is actually, President Trump is a symptom of this, not a main cause of this issue. So two questions, one, if it wasn't Trump presidency for the last four years, would the uh, situation be different? Would the United States be not that close to an exit from hegemony? And second question, if in the November elections, if Biden will win the presidency, do you expect any change in the US behavior in regards to uh, its role in international relations? So those are both really great and important mm. questions. So let me take them in a row. So, you know, according to our timeline, you know, the peak of this 1990s hegemony was in the late 90s and the early 2000s, really during the global war on terror, um, before the insurgency in Iraq had really started to pick up steam. And indeed, 2004, is about the inflection point on number metrics, right? When you think about mm -hmm. transatlantic expansion, of the EU and NATO, uh, you think about the US still having a forward military presence in places like Central Asia. Um, and the mid 2000s is when you start getting waves of pushback. And it's actually one of the important markers of the color revolutions um, within sort of Eurasia, 2003, 2004, 2005, that recodes Western democracy promotion as a potential regime threat. And that starts to initiate the first round of restrictions on um, democracy promotion, on NGOs, on, and so forth. So, so this is all before Barack Obama takes office. Obama comes into office during a second big um, um, sort of event here. If the Iraq war you know, was, 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 was the first, it's the great financial crisis, right? Where, so, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Western financial system um, implodes from within uh, and, 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 
and, and has you know, all sorts of ripple effects around the world, one of them which is China starts to assert itself as an alternative public goods provider by doing a number of loans for energy deals in Latin America, in Eurasia, and so forth. Um, and then you can think of 2014, two years before Trump is, um, assumes the presidency, as being really important in a number of ways, right? One is the Ukraine crisis, which marks a decisive Russian break, right? With what it calls the rules that have been imposed on us from the past. And for the Russians, Ukraine is not so much a local conflict, it's a crisis in international ordering. 2014 is also the drawdown timeline that's announced in Afghanistan. And of course, it's also um, um, the timetable when the BRI um, introduced just a couple of months beforehand is introduced in earnest by China. So all of these dynamics, all of these alternative ordering dynamics are well in play before Trump assumes the presidency. And in fact, um, you know, Trump is involved and the campaign is involved in a number of these sort of transnational types of networks. Um, I think our point is that, um, you know, would you have gotten maybe a different COVID response and WHO policy? Yes, I think clearly you would have seen a different WHO policy. Would that in and of itself have stemmed this feeling of uh, unraveling? Uh, no, it's just that the shape of unraveling and its tone and its tenor uh, may have been more prolonged. I think the danger with a Biden presidency is the assumption that somehow you put together these different foreign policy priorities and you can instantly rewind yourself to 1999, right? Or 2008, 2009. That would be a mistake. It would be a conceptual mistake and it would be a policy mistake. Uh, and instead, there are certain things the Biden administration can do. It can rebuild foreign policy capacity, State Department capacity. It can rebuild an interagency set of purpose and deliberation in all these sort of policy areas. Um, but it can't roll back time completely. And if it tries to start behaving as a hegemon does, uh, then I think it's also going to create other potential problems for itself. So I think the best thing one can expect from a Biden presidency is to shore up the core system of alliances and relationships um, and try and recommit to them. Um, but per, frankly, try and work on the credibility problems now that the U.S. has created in of this. Um, so I think it, the, the task is much in, in, in some ways, it's, it's, it's just as important, but it's a, it's a more lower level. It's not global leadership anymore. It's, it's, it's uh, 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 you know, supporting, uh, you know, what was once thought to be the very heart of the West uh, that has started peeling off. So, you know, Dan feels differently about it, but that's, that's my take. Dan? No, I don't disagree. And I'll just add that the, the reason why this issue of consolidating kind of the core U.S. alliance system is so important, I just want to underscore is because U.S. hegemony, even the hegemony of the 1990s, right? U.S. power is really dependent upon the existence of a cartel relationship with other advanced industrialized democracies. Absent that, it's a very, very different world. And to the extent that continuations of Trump policies threaten to disrupt that, that could have a very profound effect on the U.S. position that would be negative. But I agree with Alex. One of the points we want to make is that the United States has entered a world in which, it, because it no longer has this patronage monopoly or patronage cartel, it cannot expect to win as many fights. It can't expect to win as many fights at the UN anymore. Uh, it can't expect necessarily states to uh, follow U.S. dictates because they have exit options. It has to deal in a more kind of complex, well, not a complex, it has to deal in a more competitive world where it has to get loose, used to losing some battles, uh, and it has to get uh, used to the idea that it may have to offer sweeteners and better deals than it once did, um, which also take more resources, which means it has to be more careful about where it applies those resources. Now, you can manage that world perfectly well. I mean, to be a great power in that world, assuming, you know, the U.S. doesn't disintegrate, right, is a, is a pretty, it's not a bad place to be. It's a fairly secure place to be if you play your cards right. But it is much more of a kind of small-c conservative management problem right, than it is a problem of sort of global ambitions. Now, sure, the United States can exercise a lot of leadership. It still has dollar hegemony. It still has unrivaled capacity to produce quality public goods. It can do those sorts of things. And that will certainly make 
uh, what the U.S. wants more attractive to other states. Um, but again, it, it is a different dynamic now, barring a collapse of China or an implosion of the developing countries of the BRICS or something like that. It's it's not that's not coming back, and that's not something I think we wish for. I think that would be a more dangerous world. It would be a world with a lot more people in poverty. So, thank you. Uh, Ellen, uh, Ellen Vaslina asks, is multilateralism being replaced by multipolarity? It's, that's actually a great question. Um, I, think, I think both. I think the multilateralism that you're seeing is taking on a more multipolar character. And one of the points that we make in, in the book and in a related essay is that we have assumed that multilateralism operates with a kind of U.S. DNA, right? A focus on juridical equality, commitment to certain democratic principles, things like, um, you know, consensus, uh, um, you know, that, that international institutions and multilateralism reflects somehow the Western core. What you're starting to see now, and we're well on the road, um, certainly in places like Eurasia, is that regional organizations and regional institutions can take on Different types of norms and characteristics uh, can be led by different powers, and intergovernmentalism itself um, can be mobilized um, with other countries' uh, interests uh, involved. And so we talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organizations, a, a nice sort of example of this, where it's explicitly for the democratization of international relations. It excludes um, Western countries from its core membership. Um, and it operates very self-aware on a set of different norms and values um, that are for preserving, um, you know, the sovereignty of its states and, and, and for combating other um, kind of so-called evils. Um, so I think you're seeing a fusion. You're seeing in this multipolar world where a number of countries are now leading alternative regional architectures, those regional architectures are, are functioning um, in, a, in, a, in a different manner um, than, um, you know, our, that we associate with typical sort of multilateral institutions. Dan, do you want to add anything to that? So, I mean, I, obviously I agree with all of that. There are two distinct issues with multipolarity. The first is, can you have kind of uh, high level global governance through great power concert arrangements in multipolarity? Right, so can the four or five great powers uh, manage kind of international affairs writ large um, as effectively, I don't wanna say as well because there are normative issues there, but as effectively as a single great power. Um, there, I think, I'm, I, think I am, in, in, so in that sense, a kind of overarching multilateralism, five policemen in the FDR term or what have you, terminology. Uh, there, I'm actually quite concerned because I think what the, 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 the first big example we have of that has been, uh, in the recent years, has been COVID-19. <laughs> that has not gone well at all, right? Mm -hmm. And their uh, specific interests, rivalries, competition have all interfered with an effective uh, global response. Um, uh, we saw maybe a better story emerging during the Obama administration about climate change, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, so we'll see. But when it comes to kind of multilateralism per se, I think multilateralism is more robust than it's ever been. There's more of it, um, and uh, there are more, and it's more varied and heterogeneous. The thing is that it doesn't, it, it, as, as Alex has said, uh, that kind of liberal way of doing uh, uh, of states relating to one another uh, has not necessarily carried with it, as some in the United States and Western Europe would like, a set of norms and values that are themselves politically liberal. And that's, that's the kind of interesting thing that's happening. There. Another question from Erhan Chivikel. Uh, is this unraveling the U.S. global order or segregation of duties in the geographically controlled arenas? Um, so I think that's, that, that's interesting. So is this, you know, potentially are we, are we going to more of a world of regions? Yes. Right. Um, and, and, and regional orders. It's a really interesting topic. I would, um, as tempting as it is to think that the world is going from one of kind of U.S. global go governance to sort of a more kind of multipolar regional order, I think that would be a mistake on, on, on a couple of levels. Of course, the Russians think of themselves this way. 
right? As having mm -hmm. a sphere of influence and setting up architectures to rule it. And so in Moscow's sense, they traditionally have been that, but even Russia's tacking away from that. Instead, what I think we're seeing is we're seeing um, an attempt to challenge distinct regional groupings on their own terms, right? So for instance, we're seeing attempts to regroup regions that we typically thought of constituted in some way. So for instance, China's security mechanism, the QCCM that involves Afghanistan, Pakistan, Tajikistan, and China cross cuts three separate regions that we always sort of thought were sort of distinct. But in these regional four, like the 17 plus one, China is trying to regroup EU and non-EU countries, right, in an attempt to engage with them. And the European Commission fears this is a kind of divide and rule tactic that will weaken adherence to sort of European governance. So I don't see it as much as these solid regions. They're, there is some of that, some, some, some regional variability, but rather there's a fluidity and contestation of what regions mean and their political boundaries now um, in a way that there just wasn't 15 years ago. Uh, and that I find absolutely fascinating from an analytical point of view. Ben, do you want to add anything? Another question from Ben Tua. How does Iran fit into your paradigm in the Middle East and beyond? Well, not so sure it's a paradigm. I do think, you know, the obvious, um, uh, you know, the obvious sort of issue that emerges is one of the Iran nuclear agreement and its status. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, if we saw kind of one deal made in the Obama administration that leveraged American influence and side bargains and trade-offs and both bilateral and multilateral fora, and the very effective use of dollar sanctions, it was the Iran deal. And, you know, the fallout now is one of um, great contestation and great uncertainty. Um, and yes, as Dan mentioned, you know, there are companies that are taking, you know, the, you know, the reimposition of sanctions really seriously. They don't want to sort of fall afoul of the United States sort of treasury and be vulnerable to them. At the same time, um, this is spurring real discussions, even amongst European countries, of how to practically um, do end arounds of US financial power in a way that wasn't the case before. This isn't just Russia and Iran talking about it now. There's a whole set of countries talking about how do you get out of that dragnet. So in some ways, that's accelerated what we're seeing. I think in terms of Middle Eastern politics, We've gone from a system which the U.S. as a perceived sort of global hegemon was trying to maintain regional balances to an out and out siding with certain Middle Eastern powers, uh, whether it's Israel on issues of sort of annexation and moving the capital, and in particular, the partnership with Saudi Arabia, right? The sort of all in uh, nature of it. And um, that in and of itself is creating opportunities for other countries, most notably I've been following Russia, to play this previous role as mediator, right? To play this role of going in and, um, you know, uh, being the interlocutor, right? Uh, 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 you know, presenting itself as a potential sort of, you know, uh, 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 mediating party in disputes and so forth. Now, whether, you know, Moscow is going to be successful in this, that's, the, that, that's, that's a different story. Um, but certainly by taking such sides overtly in the sort of Saudi-Iran dispute um, and set of proxy wars going on in the region, um, you know, the U.S. is now playing a much different role in the Middle East, um, as well as the kind of greater systemic consequences of reneging on this deal with Iran. Ben, do you want to add anything? Uh, one last question, actually. We are uh, two minutes, uh, actually, uh, past our time. We have supposed to finish at three, but I have a question. There is this argument that there is this wave, it's a global wave, and you mentioned this in your book. There is uh, economic protectionism in most of the countries, and we even have the debates about the trade war right now. Uh, we have uh, domestic populism, political populism in most of the countries. And we have foreign policy isolationism. And when we look at the rise of Trump and rise of several movements in uh, Europe, across Europe, actually, uh, 
we see that those three movements are somehow uh, become a major political wave that influences the political system in countries. Do you expect the continuation of these foreign policy isolationism, economic protectionism, and political populism in most of the European countries next year and the year after? Most of them have their own elections. And do you think it would change the dynamics and foreign policy in those countries? Um, I personally do, and I know it's the third one in mm -hmm. a row I've answered, but I'll let Dan sign off. Mm -hmm. I think what you're seeing associated with, with populism is also a greater openness to multipolarity, right? Mm -hmm. And Dan and I have written about this as a chapter in the book, we also have a foreign policy piece, where yeah. one of the ways that you signal that you're a sovereigntist, that you care about the country, mm -hmm. is saying, why should we just be part of the West now? We can pick and choose. If we want to partner with China, that's great. If we want to partner with Russia, that's great. If we want to go partner with the Gulf, we should do that. We shouldn't just be limited to you know, these traditional kind of Western partnerships and institutions. That's tended to be a pretty effective winning message. Now, one can say the counterexample of Greece, where you had a populist government and then they went out of power. Well, Greece is interesting in the sense that, yes, you have a kind of a, a more conservative technocratic government now, but relationships with China are very strong uh, and that you see sort of Greece becoming this kind of, you know, classic involving itself with as many partnerships as possible type of case. Mm -hmm. um, so my sense is there will be an ebb and flow on particular trade issues. Um, uh, and, you know, of course, you know, questions of sort of migration and refugee status that have been sort of the cornerstones of this populist movements and this polarization. But the foreign policy dimension that calls for alternatives, I think is gonna to continue to be a very powerful mobilizing force. Um, and you know, one that is only going to be counteracted, as Dan says, if you see an actual implosion of China or one of these alternative partners. Thank you, Dan. No, I mean, I think that's probably right. These things do ebb and flow and the fortunes of particular political parties can rest heavily on conditions that exist at times of elections, as we all know. Um, and so there are ways in which um, the, the, the real strength of the, Europe, the rise of the European right was contingent upon the Great, Depre the Great Recession, plus the refugee crisis and a bunch of other things. I think it's important though that these forces are there uh, and that they're there to stay and that they've run, they're running some countries and they are always kind of one, one economic downturn, maybe this will be it, away from uh, taking power in some other ones right? Uh, that mainstream parties have adapted their positions uh, to reflect, to try to counteract their support. And so I do think that sort of, so these forces are something that we're going to be living with for a very, very long time. And that's because, you know, sort of the, the, the sheen of 1990s, everybody's got to be liberal <laughs> in the small L liberal sense, right? Is, it's just gone, right? There are other models there. The U.S. is not looking like a great model right now <laughs> for a lot of states uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's going to be around to say, I do think that we have to be careful about using the term isolationism, mm -hmm. um, because as Alex stressed, a lot of the ways in which uh, the kinds of movements we're talking about uh, affect international order uh, and, and, and alter international order is precisely by uh, changing their partnership portfolios. So it's not a matter of sort of being inward looking per se, except to the extent that uh, a lot of foreign policy ultimately is a function of domestic politics uh, in terms of you know the need to win support and promote certain sectors uh, but it's but they are they are different and they are engaged differently and engaging differently i think in the united states that's incredibly important because some people call trump and certainly the people who are behind trump who want to inherit the kind of conservative nationalist mantra call call them isolationists because of their skepticism about multilateral institutions but they're not at all isolationist right they have certainly very engaged with the world in a lot of ways even if it's more transactional and bilateral and uh more quid more kind of explicit quid quid pro quos uh, but they also you know are fine with militarism you know, to come back to the question that we had before. I think Steve Wertheim wrote a piece in 2017 that was really on the ball. It said, you know, Trump's not an isolationist. He's a hegemonic militarist, right? Who mm -hmm. believes that, the, that military force undergirds successful uh, American 
primacy and continued ability to push back against uh, China, for example. And if you look at Defense Department policy, and if you look at what the United States is doing in the Pacific, it's very aggressive. Um, so I think we need to be careful about that because we often think, because isolationism, of course, is this term that was developed to discredit uh, the people who didn't want to make permanent commitments to Europe uh, and say that they caused World War II. And now we tend to use it as a kind of way of talking about um, foreign policies that the establishment doesn't like. Um, but, uh, and indeed, the United States was highly engaged in the war period in trade and diplomacy. It was running an empire in the Pacific. It was intervening in Latin America. This is not isolationist. Um, and I think that we need to, if we're more precise about what we mean, we can start to see that the choice is not necessary between uh, different, you know, lead, potential leaders of the United States. They all want to do kind of American leadership. It's just they have very different visions of what that looks like. Um, so... I just want to thanks. say thanks again, and I want to apologize to everybody for the technical staff views. We changed around the um, presentation a little bit, and Alex, I don't think, had time to fully adapt, so he was, that was why we had the order issues. And then apparently we had a crisis with my cat. But I do want to, I do thank you for your indulgence and for really these excellent questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Nexus and, and Professor Cooley. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank you for all of our audience, and uh, we hope to see you in our next book talk at SETA DC. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alex. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.